end of Title 42, a COVID era policy that allowed the U.S. to expel migrants without considering them for asylum has led to confusion and desperation along the southern border. Many migrant families are now rushing to embark on a harrowing journey in search of a better life. One young family chose to leave Venezuela for, for the U.S. Uh, months ago. Juan uh, Jose Elias and their two children, who are only three and five years old, traveled through the jungle for days before they were attacked and robbed. They say three women in their large migrant group were raped during their journey. The family finally made it to the Texas border and spent three weeks in Ciudad Juarez trying to schedule an appointment with border officials using an app the White House has touted as a legal way to schedule meetings with officials. After all of that, they chose to cross into the U.S. and were eventually processed by the Border Patrol. Now they are settling in as they await the next steps in the migration process. Uh, joining me now is someone whose nonprofit supports migrant families like this one. Uh, Krishomara Vinaraja is the president and CEO of the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. She is also a former foreign policy director to Michelle Obama. Uh, it's great to have you with us, Chris. Thank you so much for your time. So immigration advocates and politicians have had their hands full for years trying to undo this immigration policy that was put in place by Trump, but we haven't seen significant reform in decades what do you want to see the Biden administration tackle? Really appreciate you having me. Um, and it's a great question because I do think it's important to understand, you know, just 10 years ago, we actually had 68 votes for comprehensive immigration reform. So when we hear these discussions that reform is futile, um, I think it ignores the recent reality um, that we have had political leadership in the past. I think part of it's gonna require us to open up more legal pathways for family reunification, for refugee resettlement, um, for economic visas, because those are pathways that we have always allowed immigrants into this country. And frankly, especially when it comes to economic visas, having 10 million jobs that are unfilled right now, we know that immigration is gonna be part of how we have a vibrant workforce that will allow us to keep things like Medicare and Social Security afloat. But it's also important to understand that asylum is a right that people have and only can be exercised when they come to U.S. soil. And so when we're talking about the southern border, yes, it's great to create other legal pathways, but we have an obligation by U.S. and international law to make sure that those who are fleeing for their lives have a way to access and have a, a, their day in court. Uh, on the GOP side, we're seeing states like Texas use aggressive tactics in arresting migrants and a Florida Trump appointed judge temporarily blocking President Biden's border policy that would release some migrants in the U.S. on parole. What do you make of the contrast between how the two parties are reacting to these developments? I think it's reflective of the dynamics we see um, these days and for the recent past, where one party has decided to weaponize the issue and the other party has perhaps not been as proactive and full-throated in their defense of immigration as both the right thing and the smart thing to do for our country. Um, you know, Governor DeSantis just this week signed one of the most restrictive immigration bills to date. It would make it a felony to bring some undocumented immigrants into the state. It orders hospitals to collect immigration status, and it allocates an additional $12 million for the transport of migrants to other states. So when we saw the political stunt sending families to Martha's Vineyard, we should expect to see more of that, unfortunately, in the, in the future. There is a great deal of disinformation in this country about migrants that obscures how difficult it is to become a legal citizen. Can you just walk us through, I mean, what legal pathways exist now and what work remains ahead of us? I think that is the issue in immigration, because I do think that much of my job is fighting fiction with fact. Um, oftentimes people look at the southern border and they say, well, why aren't they coming the right way? The truth is there really isn't a right way anymore. It's why we had Ukrainian refugees after Putin's invasion come to the southern border. It's why you see Chinese and Indians um, others from the weather, uh, you know, some from the Western Hemisphere coming to the southern border because uh, other programs like family reunification take decades to get families um, to be reunited. Economic visas, it's like hitting the jackpot um, because it is so difficult uh, to be able to come in that pathway. 
um, refugee resettlement under the Trump administration went from 110,000 being the target to 15,000. And so a program like that, which has always had bipartisan support, um, we've actually resettled more refugees under Republican administrations than Democratic ones, was essentially shut down. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. What you see at the southern border is not just a local issue. It's a reflection of the fact that the immigration system here in the U.S., across the board is not functioning. Uh, before you go, I wanna get your um, your thoughts on, I mean, the work that your nonprofit supports with migrant families, you get to see the types of people coming into this country firsthand. And, and you know, we, we live in a country where the right wing and certainly the right wing media vilify immigrants. And even if there is an act by an immigrant, um, a violent act, it is then used to paint and taint uh, the hundreds of thousands coming in here. But as you saw in our setup that we just mentioned a, m a moment ago, the plight and the struggles of uh, these migrants who are coming into the US, what they've endured, whether it's women surviving rape and violence or others. But talk to me about the types of people you see and how common um, the stories that we profiled are similar to what you're seeing. It's heart wrenching, um, but it is also to me. Um, it makes you understand the plight that these parents are facing. Um, we had a client, uh, a Venezuelan family, um, where the mother, you know, spoke to us. Um, we were serving her and her children, and she explained how just speaking up uh, against the government. Um, put you uh, in grave danger. Um, all of her children are deaf. Um, and so she traveled with her husband and her four children uh, to come to the U.S. We're actually working to help them um, get hearing aids so they can hear for the first time in their lives. Wow. And that's just one, um, you know, small example of, of what parents will do, just as any of us would do for our children. Um, so many in, this, in our hemisphere are facing gang violence, um, you know, war, uh, political instability, um, climate disaster. And unfortunately, it's only going to get worse. And so this is where we have an opportunity to lead the charge to do what we've always done in terms of being a nation of immigrants and to provide these families with, with refuge, with freedom, an opportunity to raise their children. And it's really, I think, um, an empathy that we need to have because it's exactly the kind of circumstance where when you see a child, a baby put into a suitcase and um, you know used to cross the border so that the baby didn't drown, I get the question, well, why would, you any, why would any parent do that to their baby? And you've got to understand that they do that because the other alternative, um, the option of staying at home is, is actually far worse than them. And so that's the desperation we're seeing every day. Uh, Krish Omara Vinaraja, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the work that you and others are doing to help all those that are seeking a better life. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Next, Ryan.